Thanks for your prayers. All right, good evening. Welcome to tonight's City Council meeting, City of Temecula. Let's go ahead and uh, start the invocation. We have Marty Treckman of Grace Presbyterian Church. Good evening. And then if we could have our flag salute provided by Council Member Schwank. Good evening, my friends. I'm all, thank you for inviting me to give the invocation tonight. I'm also representing the Interfaith Council of Murrieta and Temecula Valley, where I'm secretary. Let us pray. Holy One, known by many names and beyond all names, God, spirit of life, spirit of love, spirit of community, spirit of justice, we ask your blessings on the people who have been called to lead the community of Temecula in which we live and work and play. Help them as leaders to not ask first, how do we fix this, but what do we need to learn? How might we need to change? And to whom do we need to listen? Remind them, because we all forget from time to time, that they're not only leaders, but also servants, and that it is their responsibility and ours to serve the common good of all. Remind them that no matter where we live, everyone, LGBTQ+, black or white, Hispanic or Asian, Muslim, Jew, Hindus, Sikh, or atheist. They're all our neighbors and our siblings. Throughout the ages, prophets have called the leaders of the people to respect and protect the least of those among us, our children, the elderly, the poor, those who are hungry, those who have no homes, those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit, the strangers and immigrants in our midst those who live on the margins, those who are alone, those who are forgotten. Grant them and us the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right and good and true. May they and we speak out when it is time to speak out and listen patiently and receptively when it is time to listen. May they and we always be guided by the spirit of community, by the spirit of justice, and by the spirit of love. This we pray in the name of all we hold sacred and holy, all that we hold good and right and true. May it be so. Amen. Amen. May you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you. Can we have the uh, roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Alexander? I am here. Co Councilmember Edwards? Here. Mayor Ron? Yes. Councilmember Schwang? I'm here. Councilmember Stewart? Here. All right, so let's start off the evening. We have three presentations. First one is proclamation for Fire Prevention Week. Extremely timely, had <laughs> no coincidence with any incidents nearby, but uh, very timely. We have Wendy Miller and uh, Elsa Weigel here this evening to receive those proclamations and along with, I think, some other folks as well. But let me go ahead and read this because I think this is, a, this is an interesting one. Uh, Whereas fire is a serious public safety concern and homes are the locations where people are at greater, greatest risk from fire, home fires took the lives of over 2,580 people in the United States in 2020, according to National Fire Protection Association. And fire departments in the United States responded to over 356,000 home fires. Smoke alarms send smoke well before you can, alerting you to danger in the event of a fire, which may have as little as two minutes to escape safely. Residents should be sure everyone in the home understands the sound of smoke alarms and knows how best to respond. Residents who have planned and practiced home fire escape planning are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire and Semecula's first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. Temecula's residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take part in personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And the city of Temecula is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living and visiting in Temecula. Whereas 2022 Fire Prevention Week theme is Plan Your Escape, this effectively serves to remind you to plan your escape route, 
And it's important for everyone in your home to have two ways out of every room. And as mayor, I'm Matt Ron, on behalf of the City Council City of Temecula, do hereby proclaim the week of October 9 to October 15 to be Fire Prevention Week. And we urge all citizens to plan their escape routes and it is critical to our community. So thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present the proclamation. All right, do we have folks coming up? Elsa and is that it? I think we have two folks. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for always supporting the fire department. I just want to say thank you, Mayor Ron and council members, for always supporting our fire department as a whole. And we appreciate everything you do for us. Thank you. And then next up is the uh, proclamation for, again, no coincidence, National Preparedness Month. And this is uh, our amazing Mike Alford. Uh, City of Temecula Proclamation, National Preparedness Month occurs each year in September, creates an opportunity for every type and every resident of our great city to prepare their homes, businesses, and community for any emergency from potential terrorist attacks and other man-made events to natural disasters. And investing in preparedness for ourselves, our families, neighbors, and businesses can reduce fatalities and economic devastation. Injury, loss of life is avoidable when we all take responsibility for preparing ourselves and our families and community. Emergency management programs such as uh, the ones we have here in Temecula and Community Preparedness Backpack Program, Temecula Alert Campaign, Federal Emergency Management Agency's Ready Campaign and the Citizen Corps Program, along with federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, private, and volunteer agencies, all work together to increase public activities in preparing for emergencies and to educate individuals on how to take action. The uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, has announced that 2022 National Preparedness Month's theme is a lasting legacy. The life you've built is worth protecting. Prepare for disasters to create a legacy for you and your family. All citizens of Temecula are encouraged to prepare an emergency communication plan, participate in citizen preparedness activities, and visit the city's emergency management website for important information. And so I, therefore, Matt Ron, Mayor, as, uh, on behalf of the City Council, City of Temecula, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2022 to be National Preparedness Month. Mr. Alfred, come on forward. And I think we've got a whole bunch of folks who can help join us out in the front here to uh, receive this uh, important proclamation. Come on over. Would you like to say some words? Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm getting put on the spot. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the staff and the council for the support that they've provided the Office of Emergency Management since I started working for the city. Um, it's evident that this city really cares about its community and its citizens and that was shown this last week during the Fairview fire. These volunteers behind us, or behind me, were really key to ensuring that those community members that were in our sister cities had a place to go when they were evacuated. We established two shelters within the city and serviced almost 150 people and about 30 different animals. Additionally, we've got other community partners that opened up their, shel not their shelters, but their ranches to house over 700 animals that had nowhere to go. Preparedness is key, and it was evident that our community is doing what they need to do in order to stay strong. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. And 
thank, thank you all so much for the work you do in our community. Um, this, uh, this event really uh, showed how folks can come together and uh, that Temecula really is a safe community. So thank you all. Thanks, sir. All right, and last but certainly not least, we have a proclamation for National Hispanic Heritage Month. And I think we have a couple of different clubs here uh, represented from a couple different of our uh, schools. So if you wouldn't mind coming down to the podium for me. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and read the proclamation. It says, uh, City of Temecula Proclamation, whereas each year Americans observe National Hispanic Latino Heritage Month from September 15 to October 15, celebrating histories, cultures, and contributions of American residents whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, Caribbean, and Central and South America. The observation started in 1968 under President Johnson, and it was expanded again in uh, 1988 by Ronald Reagan to cover a 30-day period. The observance was formally enacted into law in 1988, and the day September 15th is significant as it is the anniversary of independence for Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, while Mexico and Chile uh, celebrate Independence Days on September 16th and September 18th, respectively. This observation of celebration through various organizations and activities support Hispanic and Latino communities locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally. The community members are represented in the public and private sector, professionals, business owners, educators, students, volunteers, veterans, and so much more. And these contributions, uh, including our youth community, and the Hispanic clubs in Temecula Valley High School and other groups. I want you all to introduce yourself here in a second. Um, and we appreciate all the work you do in our community. And I, Mayor Matt Ron, on behalf of the City Council, City of Temecula, hereby proclaim September 15 to October 15 to be National Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you so much for coming down. And if you wouldn't mind, I think we have uh, folks from a couple different places. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, tell us where you're from. I'm Jacob Cabrera, and I was from uh, the United States. My parents came from Mexico. They immigrated here as illegals back in the, back in the 1990s. I was born here in 05, and I love my country. I just want to make my Hispanic. Thank you so much. Be known. Right. And do we have the advisor here as well? You're the assistant principal. Do you want to say some words too, please? Thank you. I'm Abel Castaneda. I'm the uh, like the vice president of the Hispanic Culture Club, and actually, you know, um, I migrated here since I was three, or hardly that I can remember. Uh, it was a great opportunity to like move in the states because, you see, I was I was having a lot of like all of my past. It was really hard. So moving to the States would, was really, really good for me and my family, including my dad. Thanks to my dad. He, he really supported me when we were young, including my mom and other my siblings. And I'm just loving my country to the best. So these two students represent Temecula Valley High School, and, and we've been trying to start a of some kind of Hispanic club or Latin American club. For, I've been there for about six years, and so we're just really excited that we have a couple students who, and there's more of them, of course, but these are the two leaders that have come forward and finally started this, um, this club for our campus, and we're really excited. So thank you for having us here. Would one of you like to introduce your program too? Uh, my name is Bella. I am one of the officers at Latinos Unidos at Chaparral. We are incredibly honored to be here this evening, um, and we thank the City Council for acknowledging Hispanic Heritage Month and everything that you do for our community. For me personally, my father is an immigrant from Nicaragua, and my mother is from Mexico. And being here and having the opportunities that I have now, it's been an incredible experience, and I thank you all for that. Hello, my name is Courtney Hernandez, and I'm from the Latinos Unidos uh, Club, and these are my officers. Um, having to be here today really means a lot to me, um, especially my club. Uh, having a community that 
I can relate to, and we all have like great connections with each other. It's really great to me. Um, but for my parents, they immigrated from El Salvador, and um, coming to America has brought many, many uh, opportunities to me, and I really uh, want to say thank you to them. Uh, hi, I'm Isabella Ramirez, and uh, my my uh, dad comes from Mexico, but my mom was born here, but she's a uh, Mexican-American born. And uh, I just hope that this club will really bring awareness to Latinos and uh, minorities as well. And I hope that we get recognized and that this club grows bigger and people will feel comfortable from their heritage and bloodline. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amelia Hernandez, um, and I'm an officer at for, uh, for Latinas Unidos at Chaparral. Um, I'm really honored to be here right now. Both of my parents came from Tijuana, Mexico, and they came over here to get better opportunities for both me and my siblings, and I'm really glad that I'm able to stand up here and show them that what they came over here for wasn't for nothing. Thank you. Proclamation for all of you. Thank you so much for coming out here tonight. Thank you for shepherding these wonderful students and leadership you've got in your schools. Congratulations and have a, a great school year. Right. Let's move on to board and commission reports and start with uh, Kathy Sizemore, Community Services Commission. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Ron, City Council members. I'm Kathy Sizemore. I am chairperson for the Community Services Commission. Our commission meets the second Monday of every month, and our last meeting was last night. We are a commission of five. There's a lovely picture of them on the next slide. I there they are. We have Commissioner Yuan Hawks, Commissioner Chris, Chris Krzyzewski, Commissioner Eric Levine, Vice Chair Gary Audi, and myself. The purpose of our commission is to review and make recommendations on topics related to the parks and recreation element of the general plan. And we work to provide parks and rec services and programs for the community. Like I said, our last meeting was last night. And at our meeting, we approved our action minutes of August 8th for last month. And we have an active group of commissioners that participate in different activities and provide their advice, suggestions, share remarks that we hear from participants uh, to help build the programs uh, better and better every year. And so we shared some, um, some of our experiences from participating in the Build Your Own Boat Regatta, second Saturday, and the September 11th Remembrance. Our next meeting will be October the 10th, 2022. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Richardson, Traffic Safety, how are you doing? Good evening, Mayor Ron, uh, City Council and staff. I'm J.R. Richardson, Chairman of the Public Traffic Safety Commission. And our commission consists of Fireman Eric Ackerman, uh, Vice Chair Robert Carter, David Maddox, myself, and Bradley Sullivan. Uh, our commission, uh, the Public Traffic Safety Commission, reviews and makes recommendations on topics related to speed zones, stop signs, signals, pavement markings, traffic design, and engineering, all things traffic. And our last meeting was August 25th, 2022. We meet the fourth Thursday of every month. Next slide. So our first uh, business item was received a presentation on the draft quality of life master plan. It was a receiving file. And the most amazing thing here is just how much work has gone into this over the preceding months. Um, it's really neat to see it coming together. And uh, you're going to be impressed if you're not already impressed with it when it comes to you for incorporation. Next slide. Uh, we also discussed the, the striping on Old Town Front Street from Santiago Road to Temecula Parkway. And uh, this was a receive and file uh, for the new striping plan, which is already implemented out there. If you've driven this stretch of road, you've seen it. And next slide. I think that is it. All right. Thank you so much. And Chief Crater, you have a riveting public <laughs> safety report for us this week. Good evening, sir. How are you and council and staff and citizens of Temecula? Well, in August, uh, Temecula Fire Department ran 910 calls in the city limits. 
666 of those were medical related. Uh, 14 fires, uh, varying from structure to vegetation to vehicle fires, and 77 traffic collisions. Uh, yes, this past week was challenging with the Fairview fire, um, but I can assure you that all our fire stations were covered during that incident. We sent engines out of the city of Temecula to the fire. Uh, we held everybody on duty in the county and pretty much on duty throughout the entire state of California for about six days. So we made sure we had enough personnel to cover reserve engines, uh, dozers, water tenders, everything you can imagine to throw at this. And there was multiple fires burn at the same time. Uh, I did call a couple days into the incident uh, to check on the health of our city uh, to give an update, but also check uh, if all of our stations were covered. And we were able to cover extra engines and squads to make sure and maintain that we kept our five minute response time in the city for our <laughs> citizens. Very important here. Um, we did receive mutual aid from all over you know, California and outside the state. I think uh, there, was, there was some, even as far as Maryland I heard, you know, responding to this. So it's a regional approach. It's part of Cal OES, and it definitely worked uh, to our benefit to have good partners, especially uh, with the governor and uh, him fully supporting a local disaster and FMAG federal funding uh, through uh, our federal partners to help also pay for this incident because it's very expensive. So I just want to thank the community for their outreach, for what they, they stepped up. And, and really, when we talk about Temecula strong and Temecula safe, we definitely are. And that's been our theme. And it, it has definitely taken hold in this community and given us a lot of support to take care of our citizens. And I appreciate that. Uh, next slide, please. And things must go on uh, while these fires are happening. Uh, our you know, plan reviews and inspections and our prevention team for the month of August, I mean, it didn't slow down. Uh, plan reviews, 573. Construction inspections, three, uh, 346. Our annual inspection program, uh, 454. And then we had 33 folks come in to the counter for public inquiries. Next slide, please. And we will never forget, uh, in the midst of this incident was 9-11. Uh, this is a picture from the duck pond. I want to thank the city, city council, the citizens for honoring 343 firefighters that lost their life on 9-11. Um, also, you can see our law enforcement partners there and the VFW is there uh, for the military side of things. Next slide, please. Uh, a request got made at the incident that I really couldn't resist and, and uh, was really a good touch. Uh, Temecula's ladder truck did make an appearance and hung the garrison flag over the entrance at five in the morning when all the crews that are going out on the line are coming in for their morning briefing. Uh, very well recepted and it meant something. You could see engines, police cars from miles away coming in with their lights on just to go under the flag and we're like, this is amazing. Uh, after grinding on this fire for four or five days, and really, uh, we're winning, but the battle was, was tough, right? Mother Nature gave us a hand. Uh, just to see that, you could tell that it, it put a spark back in to what we were doing, and they really jumped out there and got a lot of containment. And then um, you could see on the right side of the screen, that's the duck pond our honor guard came out and actually carried the flags in uh, first class, and we appreciate everything that was done on 9-11 to honor us while we are still battling and trying to uphold what uh, the 343 firefighters that lost their lives and, and really, you know, uh, put that on ourselves to carry that flag still today with pride and honor, so. I thank you very much, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Chief. All right. Uh, let's see. Moving on to public comments, non-agenda items. Do we have public comments this evening? 
We do, Mr. Mayor. We have several public comments on non-agendized items. The rules are provided in the agenda, in the printed agenda, as well as the online agenda. Each speaker has three minutes. The first speaker is Debbie Alton, to be followed by Maribel Sebastian. Debbie, good evening. Good evening. I applaud you for letting us speak today. I'm starting with the end. My group knows me in case this doesn't fit in. As a sanctuary city for those facing abortion or who are in abortion recovery, we can walk alongside of these women and families with providing them truth, education, and options to empower their choice of life. So when a woman says, my body, my choice, she has choices including the choice of life. Um, good evening, my name is Debbie Ayton. I am the RN nurse manager of birth choice in Temecula. Abortion has become a panacea and normalized in our society. It can be the result of pressure and fear. Options to abortion are being left completely off the table. My medical points, number one, it's a fetus. Is it a fetus? How many people think that life starts at conception? I'm not gonna give you time, I'm gonna answer it. At 22 days, a heartbeat begins to beat and can be detected. At the moment of conception, DNA combined from both parents creates a distinct individual. At eight weeks, the brain begins. At nine weeks, the baby can suck his or her thumb. We know it is a human being. Number point two, what types of abortions are there? There are basically two types, medical abortion, which is also known as the abortion pill. It's supposed to be safe, not for the baby, but up to 10 weeks for the mom. Surgical abortion is suctioning of the baby up to 16 weeks, and then dilatation of cervix and the removal of the baby after euthanizing baby by cutting the um, spinal cord. We are not seeing this that much anymore, but we will see as we do late-term abortions. And back to the pill. The pill, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be a serious issue. The safety mechanisms or, or proposals have been taken away but is absolutely something that was used to determine the gestational age, whether the baby was in the uterus or not, whether the baby was alive. These 16-year-olds are taking it at home by themselves, and they, they will have many complications without these safety mechanisms. And they can get it, as you know, online. Ignoring the risks do not make them go away. Why shouldn't these women deserve the safety and precautions that are practice in any other area of medicine. My mantra, my oath, first do no harm. We will see the loss of life due to this, make no mistake, unless we step in. About abortion care, someone asked, how do women feel after abortion? Obviously women recover differently. While many women may want to shout their abortion, enjoy, 326,000 have been to Rachel's Vineyard, for after abortion healing. If abortion is no big deal, why are these women going to a healing program? Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Maribel Sebastian to be followed by Leanna Westcamp. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Maribel Sebastian. I have been in mental health for over a decade. I hold a master's degree in psychology with emphasis in marriage and family therapy. Over the years, I have worked in the capacity of counselors and therapists in inpatient and outpatient settings, such as crisis centers, residential facilities, and psychiatric hospitals. I have worked with people struggling with addictions, suicidal ideation, and even those that have attempted to take their own life. Upon assessing them individually, I realized that they all share one thing in common. They are all suffering from immense pain. These individuals have had some traumatic event in their lives and or are unable to deal with the stressors of life. They have not learned healthy coping skills to deal with their pain and therefore begin to engage in self-destructive behaviors. For the last year and a half, I have had the privilege to work for Bird Choice Centers. Among my job responsibilities are to facilitate the post-abortion healing class. Women in need of healing take this class that want to be set free from the guilt and shame associated with having the abortion. These women report having had their abortion decades prior 
and suppressing the memories from the traumatic experience. They report having emotional and psychological symptoms such as depression, anger, anxiety, regret, PTSD with flashbacks and nightmares. Some behavioral changes they suffer after an abortion are crying spells, sleep and eating disorders, alcohol and drug use, and suicidal impulses. Women report that they have carried this burden with them their entire life, with some not even sharing their secret with anyone. They confess that if they had been educated on their options and the long-term effects of an abortion, they would, have chose, they would not have chosen to end the life of their child. Women say that they were misinformed and were not educated on their options of parenting and adoption. If they had, they would have chosen life for their child. The majority of women regret having had that abortion after realizing that they murdered their child, and that is in quotation marks. The victims of abortion are not just the women who went on to have the abortion, but their murdered, their murdered children, husbands, extended family members, and living children. Abortion severely damages the woman's ability to form healthy relationships with loved ones. The husband is not able to understand his wife's behavioral and emotional symptoms and therefore cause great marital stress. Abortion also impacts the mother-child relationships. Many mothers don't bond with their children, and those that do bond in unhealthy ways. Some withdraw from their families and do not mother at all. These relational issues Sorry. tear down the family unit, destroying our cities and communities. With that being said, I'd like to see a life-affirming resolution passed in the city of Temecula. Please consider making Temecula a city of refuge. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Liana Westcamp, to be followed by Tim Thompson. Welcome. Good evening, city council members. I am speaking in support of life. We hear the statistics that one in four women have had an abortion, so let's turn that around and see that that means three out of four women have chosen life. The news shows women screaming for abortion rights, but I want you to see that the majority is pro-life, but for some reason remain quiet. But you, resent, re, you represent them as well, and you can be a voice for them. There is no more room to sit on a fence. There are only two sides, a society, a government that values life or values death. I come before you as a survivor of abortion, not the one being aborted, but the one that had one. Abortion doesn't just destroy the life of a child. It can and most of the time does destroy in some way the woman and or the man that has had one. I bought the culture lies that it was just a clump of cells and, I, and it would be just fine. It would be erased and it would be forgotten. And I did everything to forget for a time until I had my daughter. And I felt the strike of a whip on my heart. That strike was truth that now invaded my mind, my heart, my soul, and every part of my being. That forgotten clump of cells now was a child that I should have known, that I should have held, that I should have valued, and I should have had. No longer able to forget, I wanted to die. But I had to live for my daughter so that my abortion didn't destroy another life. So I was the living dead for 10 years, my life, my marriage, my relationships hanging on by a thread. Only a great and loving God could change me, and he did. He's, he restored and redeemed me, and that is the only reason I am standing here today. Do not let the screams of the few drown out the truth that abortion steals, destroys, and kills. So I come with my story to implore you to stand for life in a place and in a time where it is needed for you to do so. This clump of cells is the beginning of a human life, and it should be more valued than a sequoia tree, a poppy flower, and a quail that the state of California honors and asks its citizens to hold dear. I ask you to have Temecula esteem and have a heart for the life of the unborn and to be a city where every resident, seen and unseen, is represented. It only takes a good it only takes good men and women to do nothing for evil to prevail. So please act on what you are hearing tonight, and I would ask that the city make a resolution for the unborn. 
I would like to see the conversation amongst the council to make this happen. We individually and together can either be darkness or light, and I hope and pray that our city would choose to be light for all to see and emulate. Let us not just be Temecula strong and Temecula safe, but let us be Temecula for life. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tim Thompson, to be followed by Rudy Gonzalez. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and the rest of the City Council. Thank you for letting me speak this evening. King Solomon once said this. He said, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. There is nothing new under the sun. Sometimes people say, here's something new. But actually, it's old. Nothing's ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. The idea that King Solomon was bringing forth was that sometimes people think we see something that's new, but really, it's all been done before. Mankind is not different today than it was 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. We all have the same desires in life to love and be loved and enjoy life together. Edmund Burke also said this. He said, those who study, don't study history are doomed to repeat it. So let me tell you a little history tonight. In centuries past, there was a god named Molech that's been worshipped, like I said, for centuries. It is a stone god with extended hands. And underneath those extended hands would be burning fires. They would burn underneath those stone hands until the hands would be glowing red. And then they would have these priests banging on drums to drown out the cry of an unwanted child that was newly born, so that way the mother wouldn't hear the cry of her child. And they would bring that un unwanted child and place it on the glowing hands of Bolek and burn it. Of course, as we look at history, every civilization who has given into that type of lifestyle where you get rid of unwanted children those civilizations have fallen, every single one of them. Marianne and Stu and Matt and Jessica, I know that each of you profess to be Christians. Zach, I don't know if you do or not, but I know that four of you profess to be Christians. There is something that's said in Psalm 139, verse 14. It says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think the four of you, I, again, I don't know about you, but four of you profess to be Christians. I think we can all join in agreement on that, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. There's something about life that is intrinsic to the values of a Christian, something that we hold near and dear. There is also no doubt that many of us have disagreed on issues in the past, but I think this is one issue that can unite all of us, the issue of life. Some people would say, what about rape and incest? What about fetal abnormality or to preserve the life of the mother? My answer to that is this. First of all, that only comprises about 3% of the abortions in America. Secondly, if our city council got together and passed a, resolu a resolution that would declare Temecula to be a sanctuary city for life, that would leave 481 other municipalities in California where people could go and do that atrocity. I beg you to stand for life. Let Temecula continue to be a beacon of light. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Rudy Gonzalez, to be followed by Jeanette Chun. Mr. Gonzalez, good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Rudy Gonzalez. I'm a pastor with a ministry called CERT Ministries. We are a ministry that um, rescues those who think that they don't have a way out of trapped situations, mainly sex trafficking. Um, I'm a former police officer and have over 30 years of combat experience on five different continents. Recently, we were working in uh, uh, Ukraine, rescuing orphans behind enemy lines. And there was something that was interesting said to me um, during the overturn of Roe versus Wade by a pastor that was getting ready to go behind enemy lines and rescue um, orphans that were uh, disabled. He said, it's interesting that we're here trying to save our children, but in America, you want to kill yours. And it just impacted me. It was cut to my heart. And I thought for a minute, you know, it says this. It says, to know what is right and not do it is sin. That's the Bible's words, not mine, but I follow it. 
Here locally, we do have a sex trafficking problem. It's something that is not maybe as visible that we see in the larger cities. But I can tell you from personal experience, I've flown to Mexico and rescued one of the residents of this, this county and here locally close to Temecula from a cartel held brothel from a young girl that was wooed off of uh, Instagram. She was pregnant. And she came back and had to battle that decision of whether or not to abort that child. Through prayer, supplication, and standing by her, she made the right choice, and she ended up having a beautiful little girl that's now three years old. And we just recently, over the last couple of months, after having a partnership with the Birth Choice Center here locally, um, we were called when a young girl sought refuge at Birth Choice because her pimp said that if you don't get an abortion, I will beat the baby out of you. You know, abortion has consequences. It has consequences, and I can say from my experience of over 20 years of ministry, that it has consequences where it directly represents and supports sex trafficking. See, if a young girl is pregnant, she can't earn money. And one of the things that we see is that a, the largest areas for sex trafficking has to do with the areas where abortion is free and open and has a direct access. So I beg you, I plead you, and for the love of God and all things that are holy, fall upon the scripture that says this, love always protects. Be a city that is a refuge for those that are seeking life, that want to be able to have life for not only themselves, but for their children, and that, they, that this could be a place that they could run to, that they would know that they would be protected. I thank you so much, and I ask you, please consider this in Jesus' name. The next speaker and last in-person speaker is Jeanette Chun, and then I have one email comment. Evening. Good evening, guys. Thank you so much for hearing us today. I'm Jeanette Chun, the CEO of Birth Choice Centers. And as you can see, this is something that's very heavy upon our hearts. When it became clear to us that our state was going to create an abortion sanctuary state, it was just such a, um, a devastation to our hearts that not only would our state be 100% behind abortion, but would not even give audience for discussions such as um, adoption and um, parenting. I think that one of the things that is the most important to realize is that when the Roe v. Wade decision came down and it was taken out of the federal government, it was exactly what needed to happen. It did not belong there. So now local states and municipalities have the option and the right to be able to decide what they're gonna do with their citizens and for their citizens. At this time, there are local controls seem to be shadowed by the state. And the state seems to be telling the local controls what they want them to do. It is state-sponsored speech. At some point, something has to give and we have to say no. That we have to stand for what we believe and what is right and what is good for our citizens. And we're asking you guys today to please hear us out and let us know that you are listening to our argument as well, that life is an intrinsic value, that at the moment of conception, the DNA of a human being has been made, and that human being has the right to life. Our very constitution in the United States, as well as California, says that we have this right to life, and that it's inalienable. It's given to us by our creator. The government doesn't give us life. God created life. God is the one who gives, and God is the one who takes away. And to that we say, blessed be the name of the Lord who does that. But it is us who are trying to implore young women to help them. They come to us very scared. They come to us in fear. They come to us and ask us, can we help? And we can. But our state wants pregnancy centers shut down. Congress wants us silenced. They say we're an enemy to the people, and we're an enemy to those that we're trying to help. And we are not an enemy. If there's anything that we do is we bring value to every single community that we're in by providing thousands of resources to parents who wouldn't have anything otherwise. It is our hope that we're going to be able to overcome this desire to only have abortion as the only option, whereas parenting and adoption are options as well. And it is my hope also that we would not assume that every single woman that has a crisis pregnancy wants an abortion. Not everybody does, but we're gonna be bringing citizens from other states, possibly even Canada and Mexico into California, and our taxpayer dollars are gonna be going to pay for the slaughter of innocent human beings that we did not say we wanted. 
It is without representation that this is happening to us. We don't have a voice, and I'm asking you, give us that voice and stand for life in Temecula. We're standing with you, and Birth Choice will always be here for the citizenry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, that is the last of the in-person comments, and then we had one emailed comment from Payam Dineshvar that said, um, I wanted the city to please remove the Ukraine flag decorations. It is not right to take a side of an unfortunate war between two countries which neither is an ally and display it. There are many blue and yellow flags by Sage Canyon Apartments, Morago, and Margarita Road. These flags are not promoting the LA Rams. Ukraine has the Azov Battalion, a pro-Nazi group, have one of the biggest pedophilia problem countries, have many dangerous gain of functions, bioweapon labs, Google sensors, this info, but can but you can look it up on DuckDuckGo. I have also seen numerous videos of Ukrainian soldiers shoot Russian POWs in the groin on band.video. The mainstream media is promoting them because they stand with the globalist establishment and Biden, Kerry, Pelosi, uh, Romney's sons work for them. I appreciate if our city doesn't display this heavy political message that is very decisive, I think he meant divisive, as it's not fair for Russian people either. I also appreciate if our city never has drag queen story hours as it did in Old Town in June, and I'm not sure if they know many of these performers are, convic are convicted pedophiles and sex offenders. I don't want this to be a regular in public settings as it is very inappropriate. Thank you for your time and attention and keeping our city safe. And Mr. Mayor, that's all the in-person comments and the email comments on non-agendized items. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on, we have city council reports. Who would like to go first this evening? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had the privilege of visiting the base camp for CAL FIRE on Sunday morning. And not only were there hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of firefighters on scene, but they took time out of their busy morning, to and they had a morning brief that day, to honor our men and women who were killed on 9-11. And to be in that group of firefighters, knowing that some of them actually reported to New York City to help after 9-11 was very, very moving. But to stand in the center of them, um, you know, during a time when the bagpipes were playing and the procession, the flag ceremony was completed, it was incredible. And I think we have, we might have a little video, just a little piece of that to give you an idea of what that scene felt like. So firefighters had come in off the line just then, at that time, and they were, had been there for 12 hours working, and it was horrendously hot. As you all know, humidity's been horrific, and anybody that kept tabs on the fire knew that this was a very, very fast-moving fire. So um, it was constant, constant emergency situations with all firefighters. But for them to take time out to honor their brothers and sisters on 9-11, it was very moving, and that video just gives you a sense. So I say thank you to, to Captain Crater, Chief Crater, for allowing me to be there and just to spend time with these wonderful men and women. 
and they really do love what they do, and they do it for others, 100% for other people. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frank. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I do have a couple of slides. If we could put up the, uh, <clears throat> the health fair and uh, open streets event. So Saturday, September 24th is the 12th annual health and community resource fair. Um, it runs from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's a free event. This is open to all ages. Um, you'll have an opportunity to receive information about health-related resources and services around the Temecula Valley. Come for the health of it and enjoy various resources, health screenings, and prize giveaways. And then there'll be an open streets uh, component of this as well. So you'll be able to participate in uh, bike-themed activities and learn a little bit more about uh, bicycling in Temecula and bike safety. And then on the right, I really want to um, just get this out in front of the community. This is a save the date uh, for October 1st. This is the Santa Gratuitas Trail Interconnect. Um, and if you know anything about um, the trails in our city, this is the biggest uh, trail connection that we're, we're going to see uh, in our time. And this will essentially connect uh, wine country to Old Town in a very meaningful way, very, uh, completely off street. It's almost done. Uh, this has been a, a long time coming, so I'd like to thank um, staff for all the work that they've put into this, Public Works, uh, Community Service, everybody's done a great job, City Manager's Office, past councils, this has been one of those spanning many, uh, many administration type projects, but we're getting very close to uh, having that open. So come out on October 1st, uh, we'll, we'll run some, uh, some rides to the farmer's market, and we'll plan on doing uh, those in the future as well to just highlight this. So this is a great addition for, uh, for our community, and we're really excited to open it. Looking forward to it. All right, thank you. Um, anything? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just wanna give a, a great thanks to all of our first responders. You guys did such a heck of a job. I was in a meeting with uh, some of the sheriff department and uh, some people from there and also from the fire department. And I know you guys were, are tired now, but you guys did suck at such a heck of a job. And so thank you to them. Thank you to city staff and county for doing all you guys do, uh, making sure that our residents, uh, our houses, our families were safe during this time of unknown, of uh, a lot of people were scared, but you guys came through and did such a heck of a job. And also, I just really want to say thank you to the residents, each other who did such a remarkable job checking in on each other, moving people, getting to each other's houses to make sure that people could be evacuated. It was just, it was orchestrated so beautifully with each other. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who um, was a part of this. So thank you. All right. All right. I have a couple quick slides, I think. Let's do the coffee with the mayor. Uh, ugh, that's a horrible picture. Um, okay, so uh, this Saturday, uh, 8 o'clock at uh, Bean Coffee Roasters, I will be doing our typical coffee with the mayor. This Saturday, however, we'll be talking about protecting your home and family from wildfires, so very timely um, the, uh, topic, and look forward to seeing everybody out there on Saturday. Next slide. Do we have... Second one, there it is. All right, so just following up with what was uh, said uh, about this this last week, um, it was a remarkable outpouring in our community of support. Um, the uh, first responders did an absolutely astonishing job protecting our community. There were tragedies, yes, um, and uh, we are uh, deeply saddened by the losses that the community experienced. Um, but out of that came some remarkable uh, community support and, uh, and just amazing response by our uh, folks at CAL FIRE and all of our cooperating uh, mutual aid agencies. Um, I'll say just personally, we, uh, we're in the process of doing a, uh, uh, building a cancer uh, uh, program with uh, CAL FIRE now, and this was our first uh, attempt at actually monitoring our wildland firefighters for, for cancer and post uh, exposure on this incident. Um, and. Uh, We'll be getting that data back soon, but we know that the uh, occupational exposures that firefighters experience are uh, remarkably higher than the average population, and the morbidity, morbidity and mortality rates of firefighters from those exposures um, you know, is uh, uh, detrimental uh, long term. So we're doing what we can to help, uh, help understand that situation. As important uh, as the mental and behavioral health uh, to our firefighters, these uh, incidents can be potentially traumatic, um, and things that you see and do are, uh, are very taxing to the men and women working to protect our communities. 
Uh, it was nice to see the peer support trailers uh, out at yeah. the incident this year. Um, and, uh, and I have to give a big shout out to Cal Fire because we're in the process right now of building the West Coast Center of Excellence in Firefighter Mental and Behavioral Health that uh, had a 30 foot wall of flames coming down it um, this, uh, this past week. And you guys dropped the red carpet from the DC 10 to protect that, put 15 engines, I think you said, Chief Crater out there and protected all of those facilities from, from any losses. Um, so that deep, deep thanks to you for, for all the work that was done to protect those assets and everything else in the, uh, in the valley and in the hills. Um, and I also wanted to say just a couple of uh, uh, bright notes that came out of this. You know, we went out to Home Depot at one point because we didn't have enough rain, you know, middle of a fire and then all of a sudden we get these torrential rains. We had a lot of volunteers, a lot of people working hard out there. Um, we went to pick up uh, uh, hundreds of rain ponchos from Home Depot um, along with eye protection and other things that we didn't have uh, easy access to. Um, and it's one of those situations where you just do what you have to do to get the supplies mm -hmm. out to our folks working hard mm -hmm. out there. And Home Depot decided to uh, donate all of those products. Um, uh, so it was a generous, generous gift by Home Depot. Um, and also wanted to uh, do a quick shout out to the CRC Ranch. Yes. Um, they moved so swiftly and so decisively in opening up their, um, their facilities and took over 700 animals mm -hmm. uh, into that facility. Um, and just such a remarkable response by the community. It's amazing. Mr. City Manager, I'd like to make sure that we, uh, uh, I know we've, I've asked earlier, keep a list of all the folks that have done some, some remarkable things over this, uh, this incident, and let's make sure we get them at City Hall at our next meeting okay. and recognize them appropriately. All right, thank you so much. Moving on, uh, consent calendar. Item number one, waive reading of standard ordinances and resolutions. Item number two, approve action minutes of August 23, 2022. Item three, approve list of demands. Four, Accept the notice of draft amendments for the 2022 Conflict of Interest Code. Item number five, approve service agreement with County of Riverside for Myriad of Hot Springs Road slurry seal improvements. Six, approve cooperative agreement between Riverside County Transportation Commission, City of Temecula regarding French Valley Parkway Project Incorporation of I-15 Smart Freeway Project Elements. Item number seven, approve First Amendment to the agreement with Moore Fence Company Inc. for fencing maintenance services. Item number eight, Award construction contract to LC Paving and Sealing Inc. for citywide concrete repairs fiscal year 2021-22, PW 22-01. Item number nine, award construction contract to International Line Builders Inc. for the traffic signal Promenade Mall Ring Road, PW 21-15. 10, increase design build contingency authorization for Margarita Recreation Center Project, PW 17-21. 11, increase professional services contingency authorization for the Margarita Rec Center, project number PW1721. 12, reject all bids for Mary Phillips Senior Center enhancement and renovation, PW2013, uh, 2013, and authorize project to be rebid. Move approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All right, and that passes 5-0. I'm gonna go ahead and recess to community services. And I will open community services this is for the Temecula Community Service District meeting. Uh, Madam Secretary, please note we're all still here. Uh, we're on to the consent cal, oh, is there any public comments? Okay, now we're on the <laughs> consent calendar, which is item 13, approve action minutes of August 23rd, 2022. Move approval. Second. All right, please vote. All right, that passes 5-0. Um, community service director report. Thank you, Mr. President. We have a slide. Just a couple items I'd like to bring to the public's attention. First of all, the Temecula Art and Street Painting Festival is coming up the weekend of Friday, September 16th and Saturday, September 17th. That's right out here in front of City Hall. If you haven't been, I recommend coming out. It's a ton of fun. Great opportunity for the community to come out and just enjoy creating public art together. Also this year, a uh, new thing we're going to be doing for this event is Cartoonapalooza, Temecula's own mini Comic Con. Fans of anime, cartooning, and comics can come together to represent and support their favorite fandoms. Cartoonapalooza will include indoor art vendors, art contests, and a cosplay contest. The event hours are Friday from 3 to 7 p.m. and on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. 
The other item I'd like to mention to everybody is our annual Fit Fun Color Run, which is coming up Sunday, September 25th. That's held over at the CRC around Ronald Reagan Sports Park. Again, it's just a great time. The entire family can come out and participate. We have events for the kids and the adults, and everyone has a good time, gets outside, has a little bit of outdoor recreation, and you know helps get, some, get them some exercise and outdoor fun. So both of these events coming up, we really encourage the community to come out and enjoy them. Thank you. That concludes my report. And I'm just going to tag on, if you've never seen the street painting, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. It's literally like you're looking at uh, amazing art, but it's on the street. It. Yeah, it's just absolutely, it's the coolest thing you'll see. So if you're around Friday or Saturday, come down to Old Town, you won't be disappointed, guaranteed. Um, all right, city or uh, general manager's report. Nothing further, Mr. President. All right. Um, I think I have a slide. Yes. So we have our college and vocational fair that's September 24th. So not this Saturday, but next Saturday between 10 and 1. And it's going to be held virtually, unfortunately, um, because when it's in person, it's quite fantastic also. I mean, the mall like literally fills up with people mm -hmm. and students who are it's looking. It's their biggest day of the year. Yeah, it's their biggest day of the year. So, um, so if you're available, tune in and... Um, get a, uh, some idea of what kind of colleges are out there and what you might want to do. Because there's also um, vocational colleges that are promoted in this too. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to go to college, there's an opportunity to see your options also. So, all right, any director's report? All right, so I will adjourn this meeting till the next one. All right, go ahead and reconvene the city council meeting to public hearing. Item number 15 starts with approved fiscal year 2021-22 community development block grant. Mr. Mayor, we have TPFA. Oh, did I skip just, that? Just the minutes. Oh, just the minutes. Well, can we just do that real quick? All right, let's do TPFA. Forget what I said. Moving on, we'll open up that one. Please note, everybody's still here, so we don't need to do the roll call. And item, do we have any public comment? We do not. No. All right, so then first item is just approve action minutes of August 23, Move approval. Second. Please cast your votes. And I'm going to guess that passes 5-0. All right, do we have a uh, director report? Nothing to add, Mr. Mayor. Any board reports? Mm -mm. All right. All right, we're going to adjourn that and now move on to what I just said a minute ago and open that public hearing for the Temecula City Council. Um, item number 15, approved fiscal year 2021-22 uh, Community Development Block Grant Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, or CAPER. Uh, and I believe we have, yes, good evening. Get a staff report, please. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm going to turn this on over to our consultant, Frank Perez with MDG Consulting. And they're going to present both of the next items. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Frank Perez, and I'm here uh, on behalf of MDG Associates and the City's uh, CDBG consultant, uh, program consultant for its um, Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, most of you may recognize me or not, um, but again, here to report on the city's ca um, CAPER, or the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. Excuse me, that one is a mouthful, but great news and great accomplishments over the last program year of 2021, 2022, and we're starting off on our new program year of 22-23. Slide, and I think I can go ahead and do that. As an entitlement grantee for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the City of Temecula is required to prepare what we call a CAPER, or a Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. What the CAPER assesses um, and provides, it provides the City's progress towards completing activities that have been identified in its annual action plan, which covered the period of July 1st of 2021 through most recently June 30th of 2022. The CAPER also reports progress in meeting um, the city's overall five-year consolidated plan goals and the priorities that it identifies for the um, city of Temecula through its self-evaluations and HUD performance evaluation reviews. The CAPER is an annual report required by HUD 
Typically, it is also completed within 90 days of the close of the fiscal year. All funding allocations and projects that summarized in the annual report have been previously approved by City Council through the reporting period through its previous annual action plans. The great news is, like I mentioned, I have great news. And we have accomplished a lot during the last program year of CDBG um, funding. In 2021, CDBG funded nine unique service providers. And in conjunction with its Fair Housing Council, Riverside County provided fair housing services by assisting 437 clients, 436 uh, which uh, were determined to be landlord and or tenant mediation uh, cases and one anti-discrimination uh, complaint that was filed. So we rely on those services uh, from that service provider to assist uh, your residents there. It did complete the construction of one uh, ADA sidewalk improvement project, which was the ADA Westside Business Park that was CDBG funded. Provided 56 underserved youth with new clothing and school supplies through the Assistance League, the Operation School Bell Program. Completed five housing rehabilitation projects through the Habitat for Humanity Critical Repair and Maintenance uh, Repair Program. They've also completed over the life of their fun CDBG funding over the several past years have completed 43 housing projects. So a really good note there as well as they continue to be funded through uh, the CDBG funding. Served, uh, city served 39 persons experience homelessness or at risk of homelessness through the city's Homeless Prevention and Diversion Program. So shout out to um, the Help Center over there on Pujol and uh, that team on, as well through the Homeless Prevention and Diversion Program. There was also services provided to uh, before and after school care for seven children through the Boys and Girls Club through scholarships that they assisted through and can pay for through those CDBG funding activities. There was an assistance uh, of 89 individuals of at risk of homelessness with case management through the Community Mission of Hope. There was assistance of 73 domestic violence victims through the SAFE uh, or Safe Justice Centers for Everyone um, over there also located on Pujol. 75 domestic violence victims a service through the Riverside Area Rape Crisis Center, which was a fairly new uh, agency that was funded in that program year. Provided direct advocacy for four foster children through the Voices for Children program, or the CASA, what we uh, court appointed uh, special advocate program, and ensured that 18 households were assisted uh, with either renter, renter or mortgage assistance through the city's MRAP program. Um, so there are a lot of organizations doing great things in the community, and we appreciate their continued partnership on a yearly basis, each with the continued hurdles of a pandemic that we continue to, to, to be immersed on and don't want to uh, uh, overshadow, but the continuous regulatory requirements that CDBG funding comes with. Um, so a huge shout out to those service providers that are within your community, grassroots, and providing those key services to those residents um, as we ensure that those funds are expended uh, within compliance as well. Uh, this concludes my presentation on the accomplishments recorded in the city's uh, CAPER or the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. Staff's recommendation is that the City Council adopt the following resolution to approve the Consolidated Annual Performance uh, Evaluation Report with the addition of public comments and authorizing staff to submit the report to the U.S. Uh, Department of Housing, of Housing and Urban Development or HUD. I will take any questions if you guys have any. All right. Any questions for Council? All right, we're gonna go ahead and open up the uh, public hearing. Do we have any public comments? We do not have any public comments on this item. All right, any comments from council? Saying none, we're gonna go ahead and Move close. Approval. Second. And please cast your votes. All right, thank you so much. That passes 5-0. All right, now item number 16, which I think you're up for again, <laughs> is approved community development block grant substantial amendment to the 2020-2021 CDBG annual action plan. Your yes. report on that, please. <laughs> yes, a mouthful on that one as well. Again, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Frank Perez again with MDG Associates, presenting you uh, the proposed substantial amendment, which is amendment number three, to, the, uh, to account for any of the closure of CDBG CV activities and the reprogramming of its remaining funds to an, a new identified project. Uh, this amendment 
uh, want to make note, uh, does take place to a previous action plan, so it doesn't impact any of your current action plan, like 22, 23, but because the funds were released back in 2020, it impacts the annual action plan of 2020, 2021. On March 27th of 2020, the Federal Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, uh, was signed into law. The CARES Act distributed an additional allocation of funds uh, through the CDBG type program uh, to what we know it as today as CDBG CV, or coronavirus funds, uh, to specific entitlement jurisdictions, such as the city of Temecula, for the prevention and the response of COVID-19 pandemic resources and activities. To date, through its allocations, the city of Temecula received a total of $1,193,916 as a total allocation for CDBG CV funds. Again, a completely separate allocation of its regular CDBG funds. And um, through the implementation of various programs, uh, such as the Temecula Assist Program, which assisted uh, 33 uh, several businesses throughout the city of Temecula on um, payroll expenditures or any uh, PPE or anything like that. That was uh, a very successful program there. And through the implementation of the MRAP or the Temecula Mortgage and Rental Assistance Program. Uh, the funding under the CARES Act allows for certain provisions and for flexibilities to be enabled, uh, that enables grantees if, to if efficiently and effectively utilize those funds and disperse those funds on a, on a rather quick basis. Um, but anytime the city does want to make any adjustments or any uh, changes to a plan, we go through the substantial amendment process, um, and which is why we're making that amendment process to the 2020-2021 annual action plan. And in order for those changes and activities to take effect, um, the biggest flexibility was that the CARES Act has allowed is the reduction in a public review period. Instead of it being a normal 30-day public review period, the waivers that the city had enacted when the funds were available uh, enacts a five-day uh, rather quick five-day public review period. I do want to make note, though, um, the city did do its due diligence and in conjunction with its CAPER on a 15-day public review period made sure that it made this document and substantial amendment available to its residents and to the public as well for that, and actually a 16-day public review period. So far exceeding the minimum requirement of a five-day review period. Um, the proposed substantial amendment number three recommendations, uh, based on the level of the activity of the city's current mortgage and rental assistance program, staff is proposing the substantial amendment number three as the following. Closing out the emergency rental and uh, mortgage assistance programs and reprogramming remaining balance funds in the activity to uh, newly identified uh, Mary Phillips Senior Center outdoor recreation project. Um, of available funds from closed out activities, uh, identified above, increased the budget of CDBG CV administration of $4,967.42. The table on the next slide will also provide a, a brief visual as far as the changes in the uh, budget adjustments. I'll leave that there for just a second. Uh, with that, staff recommends that the, uh, this does conclude my presentation and, and with staff's recommendation uh, to the city council, adopt the one resolution of the substantial amendment to the 2020-2021 annual action plan, CDBG CV funds, closing out the activities and reprogramming remaining funds. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. Any questions of the council? All right. We'll go ahead and open that public hearing. Do we have any public comments? We do not. Any comments from council? Seeing none, looking for a motion. Move approval. Second. Please cast your votes. All right, thanks so much. That passes 5-0. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, and then item 17 this evening, consider a negative declaration, general plan amendment, plan development overlay amendment, development plan and tentative track map Planning application number PA 20, 13, 23, 24, 25, and 26, continued from our August 23 meeting. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Ron, council members. Um, as you did state, okay. This is planning application numbers PA 20, 13, 23, 13, 24, 13, 25, and 13, 26, which is the rendezvous phase two project. So it is a development plan for 134 unit multifamily community 
has a tentative track map, a general plan amendment to change the professional office to a medium density residential land use, and a plan development overlay amendment to allow for multifamily residential development. A little bit of background on the project as a whole. Back in 2002, um, the Temecula Village plan development overlay was approved by the city council. It had residential in phase one and a commercial and office component in phase two. In 2016, the applicant submitted two projects. One project was residential and one project was commercial for review by staff. In 2017, the applicant withdrew the commercial project. There was an anchor, anchor tenant, which happened to be smart and final. They pulled out of the project and then as soon as your anchor went away, everyone else in the center went away. In 2018, the residential project, which is the phase one, which is now constructed, was approved by the Planning Commission. So this is the project location. It's located approximately 150 west of Cosmic Drive. You see Rancho California Road uh, on the top of the screen. This is the phase one, which in this area was under construction. It's now completely built out. And then phase two is the lower portion of the, of the project site. So it is located in the existing Temecula Village Plan Development Overlay, 7.6 acres, 134 multifamily units. There's 56 one-bedroom units, 651 to 779 square feet, 42 two-bedroom units, 1163 to 1257 square feet, 36 three-bedroom units, 1341 to 1431 square feet. So we got a good mix of unit types. So there are amenities in phase two. There's a pool spa area, which contains an outdoor kitchen, fireplace, and bike racks, um, a tot lot, exercise room, and a turf area. So in terms of parking, 280 parking spaces are required by the development code, and 280 spaces are provided. So this is the site plan. You've got the main project entrance, which is the project entrance for both phase one and phase two as you go up the road to phase one. Phase two is on the bottom. And then this is the uh, proposed amenity area. So just again, the overall site plan uh, in red is phase one, fully built, occupied, and then phase two on the bottom. So this is the amenity area for phase two. So again, pool area, pool, spa, exercise, uh, barbecue area, bike racks, tot lot. So here's the elevations. Um, I'm sure most of us have driven by this project site. So fortunately, you get the elevations, but then you also get what the projects are gonna look like. So the architecture for phase two is exactly the same as phase one. So what you see out there right now is what you'll see built as part of phase two. So a couple different angles of phase two, or phase one, which will be the same as phase two. In terms of landscaping, there's 56% total landscape on the project site, which is greater than the 25% minimum required in medium density residential. You have a coast live oak, some rock rose, red yucca, star jasmine, and skyrocket juniper. So there is a general plan, <coughs> excuse me, amendment proposed with this. It changes the general plan land use from professional office to medium density residential, and you can see the project site right in the middle of the screen. There is a plan development overlay amendment. The original was approved in 2002. This proposed amendment does propose to add language specific for multifamily housing, change the name from the Temecula Village plan development overlay to the rendezvous plan development overlay, reduce the number of planning areas from three to two, and renaming them from sub area A, B, or C to upper site, which is phase one, and lower site, which is phase two. Increasing the number of allowed residential units from 160 to 294 to account for the already constructed phase one and the proposed phase two. Also, removing the development standards and design guidelines that pertain to commercial or office development, limiting the height of structures along the eastern setback adjacent to the single family residential development to 16 feet in height, removing an access point to the project site from Rancho California Road. There was originally two access points, now there's just one. And removing the signage program as it does not pertain to multifamily development. There is a tentative track map. It's consolidating eight existing contiguous parcels into a single parcel. Then there's also the community-wide <clears throat> Um, extraordinary public benefit. So in March of 21st of 2000, the City Council adopted the GMP or the Growth Management Action Plan. The GMP applies when projects involve land use changes and including general plan amendments. 
The community-wide public benefit for this project as was determined by the City Council ad hoc in Phil Land Use Subcommittee is a $500,000 payment to the city. This payment will be used by the city for citywide projects that benefit the community. Fiscal impact analysis. The city's fiscal policies require that an FIA or fiscal impact analysis be completed for any development that proposes an increase in residential density from what is currently allowed in the general plan. The FIA evaluated the reoccurring general fund revenues and expenditures generated by the project by estimating the fiscal impact on the general fund resulting from the development of the project over a 20-year time period. The FIA did find the project would result in a uh, city services deficit, and the FIA will be used in creation of a funding mechanism to pay the city as mitigation for the city services deficit. There was one community meeting, October 20th of 2020. It was organized by the applicant as a virtual community meeting via Zoom that was attended by staff and five residents. There was a web link and call-in option that were provided to the surrounding residents and neighbors within a 600-foot radius, 600 radius of the project. And there were no questions, comments, or concerns raised by any of the residents that attended. This project also did go to the Land Use Infill Subcommittee. May of 2018, uh, the owner presented the project. At that meeting, no issues are raised and the community benefit was discussed. September of 2020, staff presented the proposed project to the subcommittee. Again, no issues raised and the community benefit was discussed. And finally, May of this year, staff presented the project again to the subcommittee. No issues were raised and the community benefit and fiscal impact analysis were discussed. In terms of environmental, based on an initial study that was performed by the city's um, envir environmental consultant, it was determined the proposed project would not have a significant impact on the environment, therefore a negative declaration was prepared. So it did go to the Planning Commission in July of this year, and they did recommend approval. And with that, staff does recommend that the City Council approve PA 28-1323, 1324, 1325, and 1326, subject to the conditions of approval. That concludes staff's report. I'm here for questions. Uh, the City's environmental consultants here, the City's fiscal impact analysis the consultants here, the applicant, the owner, everyone's here. All right, thank you so much. Let's start with Council questions. Stu. So did the uh, developer give any reasons why he wanted to move off of commercial office? We can definitely have the developer come out and discuss that. Um, we, staff was told that uh, due to the economic downturn and in the location that commercial is just not an option there. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I kind of figured. Yeah. I was just more doing it for the... And it was actually manager. about 50% um, commercial and 50% office. Okay. And you, it's just not a good spot in the city to have office right when you're surrounded by all the residential development. Right. And now with office space probably at a glut, you know, we don't need to build offices that won't be used. All right. Anything else? All right. It is a public comment, so let's go ahead and open that up. Do we have any public comments? We do, Mr. Mayor. Alex Madrid. Evening, Alex. Good evening, uh, City Council, Mayor. Uh, let's see, uh, my name is Alex Madrid. I'm a member of the uh, Southwest Regional Council of Carpenter. I live in the local area, work and recreate in the vicinity of the project. I believe I will be impacted by the environmental impact of this project. The city should require the project to be built utilizing a local and skilled and trained workforce. Local hire and skilled and trained workforce requires reduced construction, reduced construction related environment impact while benefiting the local economy. In a recent 2020 report titled Putting California on the High Road, a job and climate action plan for 2030, the California Workforce Development Board concluded that investing in growing and diversifying upskilling California's workforce can positively affect returns on climate mitigation efforts. Moreover, just this year, the South Coast Air Quality Management District found that the use of local state certified apprenticeship programs or a skilled and trained workforce with a local hire component can result in air pollution reduction. Other cities have not hesitated to apply skilled and trained workforce requirements for private development projects in their cities. 
Recently, the city of Hayward in Northern California adopted a skilled and trained workforce requirement into its general plan and municipal code. Local skilled and trained workforce requirements can boost economic development and mitigate transportation and greenhouse gas impact by minimizing vehicles miles traveled. The, sh the city should prepare an EIR for the project. The ISMND fails to support its finding with substantial evidence. It fails to support its land use analysis with substantial evidence. It fails to support its finding in greenhouse gas impact with substantial evidence. The greenhouse gas reduction plan is not a qualified climate action plan or a greenhouse gas reduction plan. It fails to demonstrate compliance fails to demonstrate compliance will lead to a less than significant impact. It fails to evaluate cumulative project greenhouse gas impact. It fails to analyze cumulative project air quality impact. It fails to adequately disclose analysis, disclose, analyze the project's significant noise impact. It fails to adequately analyze hazard and hazardous material impact. It fails to adequately analyze the project's significant biological impact. It fails to adequately analyze the project's significant transportation and traffic impact. The project violates the state planning and zoning law as well as the city's general plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, those are the only in-person comments. Um, and for the record, I will also note that we received a um, multi-page um, comment letter from attorney Michelle Sai, which was um, made a part of this record and is also um, was also uh, provided to the Community Development Department as well. Um, but other than that, that is all the public comments. All right, thank you. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close that public hearing. Oh, sorry. Um, I think you need to give the developer an opportunity to That's comment right. on the public comment. <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry. Evening. Good evening, Mayor Ron, council members, city staff, and city representatives. My name is Andrew Dixon. I'm the representative of the applicant, uh, which is Rendezvous Multifamily LP. Uh, if I could just take two seconds uh, before I talk about our project, I just wanted to sincerely thank uh, Chief Crater and, and all those people that helped with the fires. I personally know 131 people that were evacuated from their homes. I'm a local resident here, and the emergency response effort was fantastic. So thank you very much for that. With regard to the comments that were just made uh, by this gentleman, uh, Anyone can say the reports don't, don't uh, hold water, but I think the best person to hear would, from would be the environmental consultant the city hired to do uh, the MND. So I would maybe ask if we could have, uh, have uh, Mr. Ruby come up. That's okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council. My name is Eric Ruby. I'm the city's environmental consultant for the Rendezvous Phase Two project, and we prepared the CEQA initial study, which is the primary document that will help determine the official and acceptable type of CEQA document to be prepared for the project. So we went through all of the 20 environmental factors that are contained in the initial study checklist uh, and compared those against the thresholds of significance that are included in those documents. and. In none of the cases did any of the impacts uh, associated with the project rise to the level of unavoidable, adverse, and significant. So as a result of that, there were no mitigation measures required, uh, and a negative declaration was prepared and circulated for public review uh, a while ago. We responded to a couple of comments. One was from Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. The other was from Temecula Valley Unified School District. Those were the only two comments submitted on the project and the initial study was completed, the negative declaration was circulated, and uh, the Planning Commission recommended adoption of that negative declaration at their Planning Commission meeting. So I'm available to answer any other questions you may have regarding that document. Nope. Any questions? Hmm. OK. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, can we get a point of clarification from, from our folks? Then I do have one. So, the analysis that was done on phase two was a comparison to what was proposed in the original EIR to what was being proposed for phase two. Is that correct? Can you uh, come back up, Mr. Ruby? Thank you. Can you repeat that question again? Well, so we didn't do an EIR. We're doing an egg deck here, right? Correct. So um, it's because the EIR had already contemplated a number of impacts based on what was proposed in the original project. Mm -hmm. So this was a comparison of, of the proposed phase two to what was um, proposed in the original EIR. Correct. It, it included a comparison. It also included an analysis of the new project uh, itself. And, and the comparison of those two projects together did not result in any adverse impacts. So no, no significant impacts beyond no what significant was impacts. anticipated. And in fact, no mitigation measures were even required. So it's not even a mitigated negative declaration. Right. It's just a straight negative okay. declaration. OK, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions, comments? You know, there's one thing I, I would like to, to do, and I think that it, it's important that we maybe start a conversation just to see um, about local skilled trained uh, workforce. I know that's becoming you a- close the public hearing? Oh, let's go ahead and close the public hearing, yeah. All right, so I, I would like to, to reach out to folks to see if we could have that conversation. I know it's been a topic, not just at the, you know, in California, but nationwide of talking about, you know, how do we use the local workforce? Um, and that's particularly important, I think, as, as we get programs like MSJC coming online, we have a number of, you know, um, uh, vocational schools and other programs down here as well. Stu, I know you've been a champion of a lot of that. Um, so I think it's, it's an important conversation for us to start, and, and I'd like to, um, Mr. Madrid, invite you and, and others out here to, to have that conversation with us because, you know, I'd, I'd like to at least evaluate what we're doing as a city or what we could be doing, you know, in the future to take advantage of our, our local workforce and the programs that exist down here. Um, so uh, I'd just like to throw that out there as a conversation we have here in the future. Um, otherwise, uh, I do have with, one quick comment. Yeah, Stu. So is that something we can actually, probably goes to Peter, is that something we can actually put into a uh, document, you know, when someone's going to build, they have to use local workforce? Um, that's a complicated question. What you'd have to do is come up with a citywide policy, probably adopted by ordinance or resolution, so that it applies across the board to all of the projects. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of legal complications with that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the studies they were talking about focus on the workforce development part of that, which is the training program. And that certainly is, as Mayor Ron said, you can take a look at right now mm -hmm. and determine if there's some way that you, as a city council and, and city can assist with that program. But when it comes to local hires, that's a completely different uh, issue mm -hmm. that has to be handled on a citywide basis. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, well. I have a comment, yes. um, and, and I would say if you haven't had a chance to get up and look at phase one, these are, it's a magnificent project. This developer builds a very high quality project. And so, um, you know, I phase, phase two is going to be equally as beautiful because it looks the same. And I happen to know that they were immediately uh, completely rented out. I mean, it was completely, they had no vacancies left. So with that, I would move approval. You know, I'll second with just a brief comment, if that's okay. Um, I wrote down a couple things, and one was the, the quality of the development. Being over there, it's, um, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I did like the mix of sizes, especially the smaller units for seniors and for, for students and, and younger folks. And then I just generally think that that's a better fit than office and, and, and a, you know, a smart and final, if, we can, if we're being honest. So uh, looking forward to seeing you build it. That's um, my Mr. second. Mayor, yes. uh, you'll need two motions. The first one, obviously, is for all of the resolutions that need to be adopted. And then second, I'll need to read the title of the ordinance, and you'll have to adopt that okay. separately. Go with the first, please. Mr. Mayor, to clarify, the first motion is to adopt all of the resolutions. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that passes 5-0. Peter. Uh, this would be an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Temecula approving a plan development overlay amendment to the Temecula Village 
Plan Development Overlay, PDO-5, generally located on the south side of Rancho California Road, approximately 150 feet west of Cosmic Drive, APN numbers 944-070-001,005,007,008,010,012,013, and that's PA20-1324. Move approval. Second. Your votes. All right, that also passes 5 0. Thank you very much for coming out. All right, um, let's see. Moving on to items for future city council agendas. Okay, I've got one. Alrighty. Over the last six years, our city has adopted themes such as Temecula Cares, Temecula Strong, Love and Family First. I know that each one of us here on this council is committed to these themes and strives to integrate these concepts into the heart of Temecula. As city council members, it is our duty and our obligation to ensure that our city operates in excellence. I know that we can all agree public safety for every resident in our city is our number one priority. That's why we spend 57% of our budget on public safety. As city council members, we took an oath to protect against enemies, foreign and domestic. We have been elected to protect our residents by recognizing and responding to all types of harm. My question here today, isn't the city council of Temecula obligated to fulfill its oath? Are you willing to stand up against all forces to protect every Temecula resident at all costs? We need to remember that just because something is a law does not make it right. Governor Gavin Newsom has already signed into law AB 1666, <laughs> essentially turning California into a sanctuary state for abortion. Another pending bill, such as the infanticide bill, AB 2223, threatens to take abortion to even a more grotesque level by disallowing investigations to, into the cause of the death of newborn babies in California. I know that there are some who would question whether protecting our unborn is a state matter or a city issue. This is our city, and what happens in our city is our responsibility. I say to you that a precedent has already been set here on our dais to take back local control. For example, at the beginning of the year, a subcommittee was created to fight against the state's mandates and its overreach, as well as other occasions where city council has supported its autonomy from the state. This council demands local control because we have been elected to do what is best for our city. Which brings me to my next question. Are we willing to stand up and fight for every resident, including the unborn babies who are voiceless? Let us be the first city in California to make a stand. Let's mark our city as a sanctuary city for Temecula's unborn. This fight has been brought to our doors because of Sacramento's overreach. Let's stand up for righteousness and justice. In order for change to occur, it takes only one to stand and speak up for truth. Let that one be the city council of Temecula. Let us be the light in the valley and the voice for the voiceless. In Temecula, a woman has a choice to terminate her pregnancy within just, within just miles of her home. Unfortunately, today there are even more options to terminate an unborn human being by receiving an abortion pill in the mail. Is that what we want in Temecula? I say, let Temecula be known as a safe haven, not for an, as an abortion sanctuary. Let the world know that Temecula stands for life from womb to tomb, and that we stand against bills such as AB 1666 and AB 2223. These types of bills will not only destroy our city, but it will also destroy mankind. The lives we stand for today may be a future city council member, a deputy sheriff's officer, a cashier at Trader Joe's, a Temecula Valley High School special education teacher, 
or even a mother or father raising their kids in the safest city in the nation. As Mayor Matt Ron says, let us climb to the highest levels of public safety for Temecula. I would like to add, let Temecula be the city that everyone wants to emulate because we choose every human being's safety to be our number one priority. Council members, I implore you to vote to advance this discussion in order to create a resolution to be a sanctuary city for Temecula's unborn. Aren't we charged with protecting the people that live, aren't we charged with protecting the people that live in our city? Do we truly stand on the themes that we create each and every year? Does Temecula stand for family? Does Temecula love and care even the smallest human being? Does Temecula safe stand against all harm to our residents? This legislative body is willing to stand up together to be a force to be reckoned with, vote to protect our residents, the born and unborn. Please vote yes today in order for us to have this discussion and bring forth a resolution that will protect our city and its people. Thank you, the four of you, for your time and consideration. Uh, Mr. Mayor, under the uh, Council's rules of order that were adopted back in January, or uh, rather September of, of 2021, um, Council Member Alexander's request will be placed on the next agenda under the uh, items to be discussed for future agendas. And the procedure set out there is that uh, she will have an opportunity to discuss the matter. Um, the Council would um, hear from the public for uh, 30 minutes, three minutes each, and then the Council would decide uh, whether to refer it to the city manager for further study to be brought back to the council or refer it to a subcommittee or to take no action. Uh, but under the rules, that's what would happen at the next uh, next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So we will see that coming up at a future council meeting. Yes. Next, next, next one. Next meeting. Okay. Any other uh, future agenda items? Seeing none, we are going to move on to city manager report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Council Member Alexander, before I begin, did you want to say anything about Mr. Murrow? I just want to say uh, thank you to his family for everything you've done in our community, for being a man of honor and integrity, of love, uh, the goofiness. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all say, I, I was running through his Facebook page today, and uh, Aaron, I'm sure you of all people know, he is uh, such a wonderful and joyful man, and uh, the little bit of time that I was able to spend with him or chat with him was an incredible, uh, was incredible moments of wisdom. So uh, I just want to be able to honor his family and just say thank you uh, for all his family even does, and bless them all. Thank you. And I'd, li I'd like to say exactly the same thing, and I will add that the older he got, the funnier he got. I think I would just add, um, I had the privilege of knowing Ed for nearly 30 years, um, long before I met my wife, before I had my own family, and we met um, on the basketball court, because um, his family owns the Temecula Dance Studio on Pujol and had a half-court basketball court, and um, got to know him, became fast friends uh, within the basketball community for, again, playing basketball at lunch. Um, but what I later really came to appreciate about Ed was he was in the people business, and he was in the youth business, and he invested all his time and treasures and talent in uh, the next generation. And if you knew Ed Morrell or you heard about Ed Morrell, you knew they were heavily invested um, emotionally and financially in dance studios throughout Temecula, Marietta, French Valley, but also in volleyball, women's volleyball uh, with Viper. And, and that's where our paths crossed on a personal level as my daughter uh, became a, a good volleyball player, and um, I just, um, I say a prayer 
to, for comfort for the Morel family. Um, he left a lasting impression on me as a person, um, as a friend, as a professional, and um, Ed will be missed in our community, but he did so much and he touched so many lives. We'll never be able to uh, understand how far his reach went, but it went far. And uh, God bless you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, City Attorney. Uh, yes, we had a closed session tonight, but there was no uh, action to report from the closed session. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this evening. And let's go ahead and close this meeting out in memory of Ed Morrell.